Uh, how you guys doing? Everybody good? Yeah! Are you ready for like the best MMO panel ever? Honestly, yeah! There's just, there's so much stuff to show you here today. I just got a few things to go through and we'll get started, okay? Can we handle it? All right. So, I know that we MMO gamers can be a bit cynical. And it's with good reason. If you look at our game list on MMORPG.com, there's over 600 games. And I think it's fair to say, um, they're not all good. <laughs> Maybe. However, just 10 years ago, we only had a handful of games to play. I mean, MMORPG.com was a site run by two guys in Hawaii. Um, and they had no idea what would happen over the next decade. 20 years ago, there was nothing but MUDs, and before that, there was nothing but pen and paper and dice, which is still good. I'm not knocking board games, okay? But there's a lot to be excited about when it comes to MMOs. New ideas are sprouting up every year, and the scene today is not going to be the same in another five years, much less in another five months. So today, we should be thankful. Here before you, we're going to have seven of the industry's leading developers. These are the guys who are going to drive the genre over the next 10 years. And they're here to talk to you. They're here to tell you what they feel is the future of online gaming. And you'll be able to ask them your questions and have them answered directly to you. I'm Bill Murphy, as we heard, blah, 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 the managing editor of MMORPG.com. And I'd like to welcome you all to the third annual Future of Online Games panel here at PAX East 2012. Woo! Woo! <laughs> settle, settle. Now let's give you a rundown and introduce the seven awesome guys you're going to talk to today. First, we have Kurt Schilling of 38 Studios. You might know him. <laughs> Kurt Schilling. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Pick a seat. And then we have Rob Hill of Tryon Worlds. Rob Hill, have a seat. <laughs> and then we have James Olin of BioWare. James Olin. We have John Peters of ArenaNet. <laughs> There's John Peters. John, you have a fan club. We have Brian Knox of NMAS Entertainment. <laughs> Brian Knox, everybody. We have Craig Morrison of Funcom. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Matt Higby of SOE. <laughs> Okay, those are our panelists. Let's hear it all, come on. Now, I swear I'm almost done droning and we'll get to the actual panel, but let's go over a few ground rules. I'm gonna start off with just a couple of questions so that everybody on the panel gets to talk. And then after that, uh, what we're gonna do is have you guys line up behind the microphones. You'll see them one over there, one over there. That's Hillary and Christina are ready to help you out. Um, and then just do me a favor and try to keep the questions as short and to the point as possible because there's a lot of you here and we want to make sure we get as many questions in, okay? Um, so let's get started. I'll ask a couple questions. Feel free to line up behind those microphones and get the show on the road, okay? Okay, guys, panelists. Number one, innovation is always questioned in the industry. Do you think we're at a standstill for innovation in MMOs? Or are we just breaking into what's possible with these games? And we'll start with Mr. Higby right here and work our way down. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't think we're at a standstill at all with innovation, actually. I think that uh, MMO games are sort of at a precipice of having a really radical um, alteration of the way that they would play. And when I look at all the games that everybody up here is working on, I think that uh, the thing that really... Uh, sets the games of the future apart from the games of the past is really an emphasis on great gameplay. I think that a lot of times MMO games have kind of suffered from not having fantastic gameplay um, and instead really using community as being the thing that makes you want to play them. 
And now I see that everybody's really focusing on, let's figure out how to make these games really fun to play. Um, to me, that's a, that's a really cool new, maybe not innovation, but it's definitely a shift in the way that these games are being built. I have to move the mic a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I think I've got to agree. I mean, I think the cool thing about our genre, more than maybe any other genre in game development, is that we get to use you guys out there, you know, the community. And our games are only partly ours. They're, a lot of them are yours. And what really excites me about the future is that the technology is finally catching up to a place where we can empower players more and more. And we can use you guys as part of the development process so that we're creating worlds again, uh, rather than just games. You know, that we can use the better gameplay, we can use the technology, and we can kind of bring them together to give players more power to kind of dictate how these worlds go. And I guess I'm, I'm kind of an idealist for MMOs. I really see them going that direction. And now that the technology is finally getting there, I think over the next five years, you'll really see that kind of move forward from there. I'm kind of on the fence. I think there's a, a lot of good innovation out there, but I think there's a, a lot of innovation that would have been great two or three years ago, but development cycles for MMOs take so long. We were talking backstage about how all these MMOs are you know, hitting this year and how everybody's, uh, you know, how long have you been in development? Oh, oh, we were in development for four years and we were in five years. And I think that's gonna be harder and harder to keep up because a lot of games nowadays are innovating so fast in six month, one year cycles. And I think MMOs need to get better. And I think that means getting dirtier a little quicker with the public and you know showing some of the the nasty secrets and getting the feedback and getting the opinion so that they can innovate faster and iterate with the community as opposed kind of behind closed doors with their own personal vision uh, yeah I mean I would say actually that already everyone is trying to innovate all the time I mean I don't think there's any like anyone here that's saying let's just try and not innovate uh, that seems kind of crazy so I think the thing is that is, as you said, it takes a long time to build these games, and so that's why, at least for us, the company is kind of built around this innovation and around that principle, and that in order to take a game that has a five-year life cycle to build and have it be innovative, you have to be thinking about it and going all in, like right at the beginning. So I think that's the big thing, is that if you want to see innovative games, like they ha you have to push it as much as you can, because uh, otherwise you just end up building this thing that was innovative a few years ago, as you said. So. Um, I'm actually really positive about innovation in the online space. I think, um, as was said before, it's just the MMORPGs are the most complex game to build out there, and it means that you have to spend a lot of time building up the technology and the tools for the team to be able to build the vision you want. And what we have now is we have a whole bunch of different companies. Um, we represent a lot of those companies up here on the stage that now have built that technology. And now that we've built that technology, Bioware now has an online um, engine we can use that to start innovating a lot more than we have in the past. So I think you're gonna see a lot more innovation than you have in the past few years in the next few years. So I'm kind of excited. Yeah, and you know, beyond just the moment to moment, like Matt said down there, which I totally agree with, you know, just making the moment to moment more fun. One of the things I think we kind of have ignored is really expanding to a market that hasn't really experienced these things. And for us, that's, you know, showing up on the consoles. There's a huge market for uh, console gamers that really don't know about the MMO space. And I think that they're going to hopefully find out really soon. And it's just going to be a huge thing. Beyond that, some innovations that are starting to come online but uh, really aren't huge is the MMO everywhere. So basically, you can, you can interact with your MMO from your phone, from the web, or, or whatever. And those are, those are going to be huge things that just get more and more scale. <clears throat> I think one of the dangers that w with innovation uh, and using it in a blanket statement is, is I think everybody up here would understand. There's innovative technology. There's innovative, uh, you know, art, art. There's innovative gameplay. I think all of us uh, in what we're doing are innovating in some way. The danger, I think, becomes when you innovate uh, in non-customer facing ways where, where you, you feel like you're the smartest people in the building and, you, and your players, it's not something your players ever see, feel, or know. Um, you know, I, as much as I love innovation, I still yearn for the, the, that EverQuest feeling again. Uh, you know, that hypnotic login music and the ding that made me drool. Um, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you want innovation, but at the same time, you, you want to get back to that place of comfort. That, that, and, and I think MMOs uh, uh, are on, 
always going to be on the cusp of, of the social online experience. Casual gameplay is going to be what it's going to be. It's going to be a rapid iteration, millions of products in the market all the time. That MMO that, that, that pushes social interaction and, and, and grouping and things like that is something I, I fell in love with 10 years ago and I still love today. Awesome, awesome. Okay, guys, we're going to do just a couple more questions for me, so please start lining up behind those microphones so you guys can ask your questions as well. Uh, the sooner the better, because otherwise, who knows if we'll run out of time. There's the spotlights. You'll see them. Okay. Uh, the next question, we'll start off with Kurt at the end there. Uh, where do you personally stand on the debate between free-to-play and subscription? Is there room for both, or is it a sort of one or the other kind of thing we're dealing with here? Oh, I'm sorry. Loaded. See, it's a fastball. Awesome. I'm, trying, I'm trying to pitch to you. So, unfortunately, the person that runs marketing and PR for us is in the building today, so I can't... Uh, sorry. Can I just answer sorry. yes to this question? <laughs> um, you know what? It, it, it's amazing to me. Uh, I've, I've been in, in the industry for, for five years, and... I've been trying to do um, everything but game design, much to the, the happiness of, of my game designers. And um, I, yeah, they're in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the business model is, is getting so much more attention uh, publicly than uh, I feel it should. Um, we're spending so much time telling you how we want you to give us your money. Uh, as opposed to telling you how awesome the game that we're making is for you to play. And uh, I have a company of almost 400 people, and it's, uh, we like to call ourselves gamers who want to make awesome games for gamers. And the business discussion tends to be kind of nails on the chalkboard uh, at times. Um, but to sustain a business and to run a business, you have to, have to, have to make money to sustain that. So the, I, I think in, in our space, I think the... the um, the move forward, obviously, free to play and microtransactions and all the things that go with go with MMOs are going to going to be in the mix, and, and people will be figuring out how to mix and match those in our games. I just want to continue to see this industry integrate the business model with an incredibly fun game first and foremost, as opposed to a, a way to, to get money from from the players. Yeah, well, yeah, you definitely definitely want the game to be good for sure. But, it, you know, I, I seriously think that there's room for both, not just within the industry, but within the game itself. And you already see that with some games. Uh, there's gamers who want to, you know, pick the things that they want to pay for. And then you have the guys that are just blanket. Yeah, just give me everything. Just take it once a month and uh, move on. So I think, I think there's really both, both models will be successful for a while. Do you think there's any reason to be worried about when people say pay to win or this and that? Absolutely, yeah. Pay to win is not something I would condone at all. So yeah, I'm on the same page. Um, I believe there's room for both. And you can just look at the marketplace. You know, on the free-to-play side, you have things like World of Tanks and League of Legends. And then on the subscription side, um, just last year, you had uh, obviously World of Warcraft continues to be successful. You have Rift. You have Star Wars The Old Republic. You have games that can be very successful financially on both sides. So I don't see there, there's no need for one to go to the way of the dinosaur. Yeah, I mean, they're totally both valid models. Um, it's about what players are interested in. I mean, I just, since you asked us, for me, there's a reason why we choose our model. It aligns with our philosophy, which is players should have choice. And so we make players pay for the things that they choose to pay for. That's why, that's it. I see why you uh, reverse the order because people take answers as you go. I know so it's you hard. You just the, say what he said. Fair Move shot. On. So I'm just gonna <laughs> throw my weight kind of behind Kurt and say like you sp you spend a lot less time, uh, you know, designing around how to make money as opposed to how to have fun uh, with a non free to play model. But I think that you know at the inception of the game, that's when you need to make your decisions of like what's gonna be fun in this game. What's the best way for us to support a business to keep giving good content uh, to each of the players? But you know I. There's space for both. I think that's been proven across the board everywhere, and I think especially in the last couple of years with you know some really high quality uh, free to play titles that came out. Yeah, they're they're tools. <laughs> you know, they're a tool set like any others. The designers and the people that make these games have in our tool set. You know, we can choose the right one for the right product, or even the right time scale within the product's life cycle. You know, we've converted games that were subscription and moved them to free to play, uh, going all the way back to 2005. So mm -hmm. it's kind of you know. It's nothing new for us, and it's kind of just, it's a natural role, so I think you can use, like any other design tool, you can use your payment methods badly or well, 
And the most important thing is, as everyone else has echoed, is about making the game fun first and foremost and having the payment method support that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my main feedback too, is having the game be able to stand alone, having the game be able to be great, and then being able to figure out a payment model that works best for it. I do, uh, personally, I really like free to play. I think that free to play is the best way for your, a gamer to be able to play a game. There's no BS. I don't have something that's either a, a demo that tricked me into buying it or a box that tricked me into buying it. I got to play the game and if I love it and I play it enough, uh, I'll spend money on it. I think that that's a really good, um, as a player, I play a lot of games. I play free to play games and non free to play games, but I love that about free to play games. I try them. If I love them, then and now it's a hobby of mine and I'll spend money on it. Excellent. Okay. One more question, guys, and we'll get to you. Okay. This is the part where you get to plug yourself. I, I hope you're happy about this. Okay. We'll start on this end and work our way all the way down. You don't have to steal answers on this one either. Uh, rapid fire time, and as few as words as possible. I know that's going to be difficult. Tell us why we should be excited for your game in 2012. Planetside 2 allows thousands of players to directly compete with one another in enormous open world persistent battles. It's uh, completely unprecedented and uh, non-existent gameplay in any other game that's either coming out now or has ever come out except for Planetside 1. I want to play his game too, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, Mark and guys will kill me. I'll talk about two. Uh, talk about all. You know, we have many MMOs and stuff, so, but obviously this year's big release is The Secret World, and I think they're the team that are working on that. It's about freedom. It's about freedom of choice and freedom of progression for players. The team have really tried to build something where players get to choose how they progress through the game without being restricted by levels or classes. It's kind of going back a bit old school to some of the original games that a lot of us loved and played, like Ultima Online back in the day. <laughs> and, <laughs> Anarchy Online and those games that had much more deeper complex systems and we want to replicate that with The Secret World. Uh, so we got Terra and it's in a few weeks, uh, May 1st and I think for us, you guys have all heard it, it's all about our action combat and really combining that console style action with you know, all the depth that an MMORPG uh, tends to lend to you with uh, you know, great party play, open world, all that kind of great stuff. All right, so short. Uh, to me it's like, Guild Wars 2 is the MMO that actually encourages people to play with each other instead of alongside each other. All right, well, Star Wars is already out, so I won't plug the gameplay because I'm sure everyone already knows what that is. Um, but uh, for 2012, we really want to, going back to the subscription model, we want players to feel that they're getting their money's worth. So. The, um, the scope of our game updates in 2012 is, is going to be unimaginable. You're going to see so many changes and additions um, to the Star Wars universe. It's going to be it's going to be impressive. We have our update two coming in the next week, and then after that, it's going to continue to roll out uh, month after month. So just uh, it's exciting. Uh, for Defiance, it's basically we're going to be the first uh, MMO shooter that appears on Xbox, PS3, and PC. And we're also launching alongside the uh, uh, show on the Sci-Fi Channel, and the game and the show are going to evolve together over time. So uh, much like I did eight years ago uh, when I came here and, and promised to help bring a World Series after 86 years of drought, I can, te <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you that when we launch Copernicus, we will change. Uh, the MMO space forever uh, in, in ways that you will all be excited by. Awesome. All right. Okay. We're going to start taking your questions now. We're going to start on this side and then alternate between the two. So please go ahead. Yeah, this question is for uh, Rob from Tryon. Uh, so I've heard a little bit about uh, Defiance, but I've never actually seen anything from the game. What's it going to look like? When are you going to show it off finally? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that actually. Um, we've shown the game at E3 and Gamescom to the press and a few select other people, but we decided today to actually show for the first time to you guys and uh, the first time the public has actually seen any gameplay. And so we actually have a trailer that you guys can check out. Like right now. Trailer time, folks. First ever footage of Defiance.
right. Holy cow. I, I have one question, Rob. Can I actually play one of those aliens that rips people apart? I can't say anything about aliens. Okay, all right. Just, I hope. Okay. The next side, please. That was awesome. Right. Um, it's probably a good segue from that trailer. Um, so quite a few years ago, Planet Side 1 came out, and that was an MMO FPS or MMO shooter, and that was kind of new. And since then, we hadn't really seen anything like that. And now this year and the last year, it seems like everything is an MMO shooter. World of Tanks, Dust 514, Planet Side 2 again, um, Defiance right there. So. I'm curious, uh, kind of, what made the industry jump towards MMO shooters suddenly and with so many developers? I think we got the right guy to help answer that on the start right here. What yeah, I, um, one of the big things that I think it is, is going back to the first answer that I gave, I feel like we're at a turning point in terms of games focusing more on gameplay. Um, I really feel like MMO games kind of have a couple promises to players, and one of those is to create a great community, um, and the other one is to create great competition. And I feel like MMO games in general have done a pretty good job of creating a good community, and I think they've done a pretty poor job of creating good competition. Um, and making a truly competitive online experience, um, I mean, a shooter's a no-brainer for that. That's a really good way to create a competitive game. I mean, um, you guys actually have a couple games that are coming out that are, are more competitive oriented, right? I mean, you have, yeah, End of Nations also is uh, another one. In. Yeah, yeah, End of Nations is a really competitive game. The, the thing for us, though, was, I mean, there's obviously a huge shooter market out there, and you definitely want to tap a big market, but um, different, a little different from Planet Side is we're really uh, player versus environment focused. So, again, building that community, but not necessarily in the competition sense, but more in the let's go out together and, and go on missions and, and solve all these problems and fight together and build that, that community that way. You know, just to answer your question, since we don't have a shooter MMO coming out uh, <laughs> uh, as a gamer, uh, you, the answer is you guys. You guys, the, if you haven't figured this out yet, the change in the business model is, is almost completely turning the, the, everything on its ear. You guys, it, moving into the free-to-play space and the mic microtransaction space, we're getting into a place where, n unlike any time before us, you guys will dictate everything that we do in the market. When you're talking about big budget games of 50, 70, 100 million dollars going free to play, that's a huge bet to make if you don't believe that there's revenue on the other side. So you guys are going to determine and drive the MMO space far more than you ever have in the past, which I think is an awesome thing. Yeah, I just want to say too, you know, MMOs are about creating a world that you interact with and there are a lot more ways to interact than just RPG. Um, so shooters are just in RTS stuff too. It's just another way to create new types of interactions and new ways for people to experience like interacting in a world. Like there are things that shooters do that we're doing in our game. There are things that shooters do that they're obviously doing in Planet Side since it is a shooter. Um, you know, it's just about creating interactions for players and there are a lot of interactions outside of just what we've seen before, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh, next question, please. Oh, uh, first, I just wanted to thank Kurt for 2004 and 2007. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I was uh, interested for, for all of you, um, sort of what, what was the game that, that, or their MMO that really got you focused on doing this professionally and uh, hopefully not your own game, but, um, uh, and, 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 and sort of how did that drive you? I guess most specifically, what was the game for the panel? We'll um, actually start on the other end and then come down. Start with Kurt. Well, I, I already tipped my hand. EverQuest was kind of the, my, my first love and, and uh, yeah, and, and it was the game, I think, that made me uh, have the same thought you all had, which was, wow, why did they do this? And, wow, this feature sucks, and I could do this better. Um, and then for some reason, at some point in my life, I decided to spend all the money I'd ever made on making one, um, <laughs> which uh, I, I still can't rationalize at home. I'm trying, uh, not winning. But uh, th this is, uh, I can't imagine being in a more vibrant, more... Uh, uh, energetic, more forward-thinking space than this one right now. The, the, uh, again, like I said earlier, we up here um, are involved in, on a daily basis and more in tune with you 
the players than in any other genre. And, and we're, uh, you know, I can, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure some of these guys would agree, so much of what we do from a tools perspective is, is, is now focused on trying to read your thoughts and understand what it is you want us to give you and give you more of. Yeah, and actually being at SOE while EverQuest was being built, you know, I got to see that whole process and why those decisions were made in some cases. Uh, but it's really about uh, the community that these things create. I mean, they're huge communities. They're very passionate communities. I mean, hell, my brother met his wife through EverQuest. So you can definitely see that they are also life changers with those communities. Um, I'm going to have a different answer. Uh, not really an MMO, but uh, Diablo was my favorite online RPG. And, uh, <laughs> it... Uh, it informed more than just like online games, but it informed a lot of uh, Bioware's RPGs. It was just a great game. I, I think I wasted a lot of... I, it actually delayed Baldur's Gate by two weeks. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. Yeah, I'm going to say, at least for me, if we're going to say MMOs, uh, Dark Age of Camelot. Um, <clears throat> it's a, it's particularly the RVR is kind of a little bit about that social experience that I was talking about that all of like our PVE and World v. World and everything is founded on. It's all based on, you know, when you see a person, you care about them because you know sometime later they're maybe going to have to save your butt. And like that's for everyone everywhere in our game. And so I just kind of took that and brought that in. So I'll be a, a little bit more specific. It, w it was EverQuest for me, but in particular the, the Rallis Zek server, which was the PvP server. And uh, I, I love that the, the community policed themselves. I liked that, you know, everybody, you know, knew who the assholes were and everybody knew who the good guys were and everybody, you know, knew everybody. And there was just, you know, such a strong community built around hating one another that, you know, <laughs> Competition, it, right? it just grew on me. Competition. Yeah, I was very lucky. Mine was Anarchy Online, a game that I later got to run. <laughs> uh, and kind of similar to Kurt, it inspired me. I was hooked. I'd played EverQuest and UO before then and Dark Ages and a bit, and, but Anarchy was the first world that really connected with me and I met a lot of great friends and I just kind of set my mind that one day I'm going to work for them and five years later I got to run it and I was game director and it's kind of a cool feeling to have that world where you're, you know, where you, I, I was there on launch day buying a box and it crashed consistently for three days while I tried to play it, as everyone knows. But through, even through that, I could always see the beauty of that world. And uh, I think everyone who plays MMOs has that first game, that game that really seals your love of the genre and why we're still here trying to recreate that, because I hope in 10, 15 years' time, someone might say that about a game that we make. Yeah. The first cut is the deepest, right? Um, for me, it was definitely EverQuest. Um, I remember I was in 2001 going to college back in Florida and I was spending more time playing EverQuest than studying by just a ridiculous amount. Like 16 hours EverQuest and zero hour studying was about my schedule. Um, and that didn't do too well for my scholastic aspirations. So I ended up um, dropping out of college, packing all my stuff in my car and moving cross country from Florida to San Diego and begging for a job in QA. And I've been at SOE for 10 years after that. And uh, So yeah, definitely EverQuest for me was literally the reason that I got a job in the games industry. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next question over here. Um, well, most players, when a new MMO comes out, they compare it to World of Warcraft. As producers, do you try to compare it to World of Warcraft or just ignore that completely? Very good. What's World of Warcraft again? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start. <laughs> we'll start down here with Matt. Um, uh, for us, I mean, World of Warcraft isn't a very good analogy. Um, we look at it for maybe social systems, things like that. What did these guys do well? But, I mean, you look at pretty much any game for that. Um, I haven't been in one of those, how can we make this more like WoW conversations in years and years and years now. No, I, I agree. I don't think you look at it from a, a point of view of how can we do something differently from them just to be different or like them to try and get more customers. You, you're looking at it for a case of how can we make the game that we're making as best as we can and how can we make it a great game. I think if you start second guessing yourself and saying, you know, well, we want to do this to, dis, you know, to kind of distance ourselves from World of Warcraft or to be closer to World of Warcraft, you start doing your, your own design intuition a disservice. So you really want to be kind of honest to your game 
and look at, and you might take some things from a game like that. It's a huge game and it's been immensely popular with millions of people. And they do a lot of things right. Yeah. You know, so you, you are going to draw from it a little, but you're not trying to use it as a yardstick by which you're going to judge your own design necessarily. Yeah, I think in, in general you can kind of out-design yourself if you, you, you kind of go down that path. I think that around like, you know, maybe 2006, 2007, you saw a lot of MMOs just trying to be different just to be different, and there wasn't a lot of, uh, a lot of good reasons or designs behind it. And so I think that you just need to be careful and, you know, set out to make the game that, you know, you think you and your players and your fans will love. And, you know, sure, you can learn things from everybody. You know, everyone here, you know, we see every video, every feature they do, and we look at it and say, oh, that's cool or that sucks, and, you know, or what are they doing there? And so you, you learn from everybody in the whole industry, but I, I think you can definitely out-design yourself on those sort of things. Yeah, as far as actually comparing, since you said, I think the reason why they compare is because it's far and away the most polished MMO that's been released, uh, far and away. It's not even really close. A lot of their MMOs are very, get, get, tend to be really rough around the edges, and especially for, what is it, seven or eight years old now. At that time, nothing was even close to as polished and as easy to like, get into. So that's why it attracted a lot of people, well, at least one reason why, and it's the reason why people look towards it as you know, what they want to do. Well, I think for all the people who were involved in EverQuest, they probably get annoyed when you know it's being compared against World of War. The games are being compared against World of Warcraft because World of Warcraft really grew from EverQuest. That's kind of the granddaddy of that style of game. I think um, it's a genre, and whenever you're working within a genre, so MMORPGs is a genre, just like RTS is a genre, just like sports games is a genre. You have to look at your competition within that genre and learn from them. Because if you're reinventing the wheel with every game system that you're working on, you're going to fail. You've seen lots of projects that do that. So, yeah, you're going to look at um, the genre and games within there and uh, make sure you learn what you can, but then you have to innovate as well. You have to have your own take. You have to differentiate yourself in some way. Uh, yeah, for us, I mean, our game's all about action and shooting stuff in the face. So besides, <laughs> besides community stuff, um, not as much. It's, it's actually kind of funny. We've, WoW's gone through three iterations in, at 38 Studios. Um, the first one was uh, how, what did they do that was just so awesome that we want to make sure we do as well as they do, if not better? The second one was uh, when we look at what we're making and, and we're, we're trying to tell ourselves that it's getting fun, but at lunch everybody's still logging into WoW uh, instead of the game they're making. Um, and the... Uh, the third one is, is the question, the burning question we ask ourselves now, which is when we launch, why will people that have six, seven, eight years invested in a World of Warcraft account leave that game and come play ours? And, and those are, that's, that's the question that we put to ourselves pretty much every time we get together and talk about where, where Copernicus is. Awesome. Excellent answer. Next question over here, please. Um, this question was going to be primarily for Kurt, but since all of you are kind of mentioned it, uh, I think anybody could really answer it. I'm a long-time EverQuest player. I saw sites like Alakazam grow up. Even when Swoter came out recently, it has, um, you know, databases half full of all the things you can do. How do you and how do your companies look at that challenge of it's really hard to design content that players are going to be challenged with mentally because there's always that temptation to log out and look it up. How do you design how they progress, how they level, and what time it should take, knowing that they're going to be creating these kind of repositories of information? Well, first off, I mean, I think we would all say that, that those repositories, we want those to grow and continue and always be there. That's, that's the gamers, that's the communities that, that in, are going to invest massive amounts of time because you've created something they care about. I, I, I can't think of any scenario when I don't ever want those to be around. Having said that, I think what we're seeing now is the, is the growth of the MMO space across all platforms. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the objectives five and a half years ago when I founded 38 Studios was that I don't want you to have to be sitting in front of a PC to interact with this, this intellectual property. That doesn't mean we're going to make an, uh, an MMO on the iPhone, but there's no reason that those, any platform in the world can't be tied into the entertainment experience that we're creating, whether it be through you know, Todd McFarlane and R.A. Salvatore Digital Stories or Todd McFarlane Toys or, or anything from a platform perspective. The platform that you're holding in your hands or sitting in front of has to, I think you have to build to the platform strengths. And, and w the community tends to drive and decide what they want, how they want that information. You know, I mean, you're talking about Alakazam. I'm sure we've all... Uh, participated in or been around, you know, uh, 
after EverQuest, every MMO came with, with exclamation points and question marks, and, and it, you know, the barrier to entry has gotten, gotten easier, which I don't think is something everybody loves, but at the same time, we want you guys to, to continue to grow those things and build those things, because that's, you're, you're the lifeblood of what we do, and that's the way that you show us that we're doing things right and doing things wrong. Yeah, that, that is great. Like, we're actually giving it away to anybody that wants to make a fan site. We'll give them all our item names and all the drops or whatever they want, right? Like, that grows the community. There's whole people that just focus just on that kind of stuff. And it's awesome. I think as far as, like, designing for it, I think you need to put more of the skill back in the player's hand and make sure that, you know, they're not just following a step one, step two, step three repeat. You need to put some sort of player skill. And I think there's a lot of games up here that are starting to lean a lot more towards, you know, how the players handle the combat in the game or handle the different skill challenges in the game, not just, you know, stand here, hit this three times and repeat. Or and use variation for that. I mean, a lot of the design we're doing now, and I think there's a lot of great uh, gameplay design moving into the kind of the MMO space in terms of the encounters and the instances and the raids and the stuff that we do at the high end of the game or even all the way through some of the games. That's come a long way in the last five years. And I think what we're able to do now is we get better at what we're doing. We're maturing as an industry. And I think if you compare any of those kind of experiences that a lot of us had back in EverQuest in the day, you know, to some of the stuff that World of Warcraft does now, the guy in Guild Wars 2s are doing, you know, in our own games, and any of those MMOs, it's a lot more complex now. And even if there's a guide, you can put enough variety in the gameplay experience and enough reliance on the player's skill and ability and reactionary uh, kind of responses that you can still make it interesting for the player and make the experience fun, even if they have read a walkthrough of your dungeon. And this yeah. is actually not a problem uh, just within online games anyways. It's a problem with all games. If you think about it, there's hint and cheat guides for console games just as much as there are for PC games. And really, I think, um, as a game designer, what you're trying to do, whenever you're designing um, a game, you're trying to hit this balance where your game isn't too frustrating and it's not too easy. If it's too easy, players get bored. If it's too frustrating, then people go to the hint guide and they just get the cheats, and then they, that kind of breaks their immersion. You don't want that. So it's really trying to hit that happy medium, which you're trying to do with any kind of game, not just MMORPGs. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they really go to the hint guide if, if for that reason so much as just to look it up. The thing is, it doesn't really matter if you look it up or if you don't. There are actually just a lot of people who don't even know about that stuff, all the wikis and all that. Really what matters is, I, I don't need to look it up to know whether or not it's fun, right? Like, that the wiki doesn't tell me that. And if the game is fun, then it doesn't matter whether or not they know exactly what they're supposed to do. When they do that, they're having fun. Yeah, I use those kind of hint guides all the time for something like League of Legends. I want to see a cool build for that kind of game, you know? And that's a, you know, that's something that should be there, that, that people should be able to share those builds. They should be able to say, hey, here's the way that I played this thing. And that's, I think, what you said. It's all about variation. If there's a lot of different ways that you can tackle a problem, a lot of different ways for you to solve how you capture this base or how you complete this raid, um, being able to share people's different strategies for that, I think, is great. All right. Cool. Next question, please. Uh, my question is really a, uh, about the balance between uh, difficulty and marketability of your games. Uh, a lot of the games that you mentioned earlier that were your favorites, and for me also, were games that were very difficult, and they operated in a realm where there wasn't a lot of other options. If you didn't want to play EverQuest, there was, a, uh, there was other options, but I mean, really, EverQuest was the elephant in the room. And um, I guess now there's a lot of other players, and I wonder how you deal with the marketability of your game while not compromising and making it you know, like adding an E in the MMORPG, massively easy multiplayer. <laughs> you know, it, and I see a lot of games now that have no basic learning curve and it's just like push one key to level once, push the other key to level twice. And I, I, mean, I guess I just want to hear s some of your thoughts on how you're combating that because, you know, okay. I think yeah. it's important that these games are, have longevity and that they're um, meaningful to people, and I okay. don't see how they can be if they're really we'll just start with easy. Yeah, we'll start with with Matt down here. Um, well, I mean, in our game, our game is all about PvP, so it inherently the difficulty curve is based on the competitive nature of the game. You're playing against other people. Some of them are going to be really good, and it's going to be really hard for you to fight against them. But then you're going to get better by playing the game. Um, it's not like there's a lot of crazy interface you need to learn, or how does this 
convoluted game system work. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's more to something being hard to learn than just how complicated it is. A lot of it is really simple stuff, but it's hard to learn because you have to get the muscle memory right. If I'm firing a gun, what's my tapping rate to make sure that I'm not getting any, uh, any drift on my shots, you know? That kind of stuff is something that you're learning, but you're learning it without having to put the time into really trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? And I think that that's the way that if you're making a great game, it's something that you don't even realize you're learning how to get better at it. You're just getting better at it because, you know, the game is, the game is fun, it's teaching you things as you're playing it. And I think most really great games throughout history kind of operate that way. You get better because you're playing against other people or you get better because you're playing it enough that it's just becoming something you can do. I mean, Kurt probably threw a lot of baseballs before he got really good at throwing baseballs. And that, you know, that's part of, uh, of how you can make games be difficult but not be complicated. Yeah, I think in terms of MMORPGs, personally, I hope, I think and I hope it's an area which will change over the next few years. I mean, World of Warcraft did, had a huge effect on our genre. Uh, it increased the accessibility of the genre and introduced a whole generation of new players to MMOs. And I think for the last four or five years, it's been safe to say the industry didn't quite know where to place itself on the kind of scale between accessibility and challenge. And a lot of games have struggled with that kind of discussion of, you know, we want 12 million players against, well, we want to make really interesting systems that aren't necessarily as accessible as something that's going to get 12 million players. And personally, I think we'll end up seeing an MMO space that will fragment a little. And I really hope that we see more kind of mid-range development games. You know, right now, the MMOs that come out, they tend to be very expensive, larger scale games that are costing tens of millions of dollars. And hopefully, I think as we move forward, I think uh, James mentioned it earlier, as our platforms get better and we have the technology pre-built and the infrastructure, we are going to be able to produce MMOs uh, for less money as well and on shorter development cycles, which means that we should hopefully be able to innovate more and experiment more. I mean that we can take you know, a smaller risk and make this game that might be a bit more niche and a bit more hardcore. You know, I think uh, all of us here on the panel would love to make games that challenged us and inspired us in the same way that the original games kind of inspired us to be here. But likewise, you know, on the other side of the coin, I think there'll be people who will be here in 10 years' time in our place who were inspired by World of Warcraft. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, and I think you'll see both the big blockbuster $200 million games that will be aiming for accessibility and the small 5 million games that might be aiming for more niche, uh, hardcore type of audiences. Yeah, I think the, the line between challenging and frustrating is very thin and that's, you know, the best designers are able to walk that line and, you know, understand when to, you know, push and when to pull. But I, I think in general, like, there's, you know, something we're doing is we're going to be front-loading, you know, our game with a very challenging instance at the beginning and then kind of taking it away. So it's almost a cue from a lot of the single-player games. You see, you know, God of War kind of go through this. You know, you're climbing Mount Olympus, you're fighting Zeus, you're the biggest badass in the world, you know, he kicks your ass, throws you off. And, you know, you start back at the beginning and then you can gradually learn back up. But you kind of got a taste of what the challenge is and, you know, how difficult it is. And so that, that's one way we're trying to, you know, show where we're at, but also still have the accessibility and learning curve, you know, for the, the more casual player to kind of get hooked on what makes your game so great. Yeah, so to me, I mean, these games are just so big that they're both easy and difficult. You find your own place in them and you find your own difficulty. Um, I've said it in the last question. I'm going to say it again. Like... The only thing that matters is if the game is fun. Um, we keep like talking about all these other things, but at the end of the day, like I log in, I log into our game, I log into games because I want to play them, not because of any other reason. So even if it's easy, but I'm having fun, like it doesn't really matter. Um, and if it's hard and I'm having fun, it doesn't matter either. Um, the most important thing is those challenges are going to be found. It's with a game as big anywhere. So just make sure that the players are enjoying themselves and they're going to keep playing. So one of the things I find is, that is a good way to design for that is you need to have the ability for players to play through your entire game um, and not be the greatest player ever. So you have to give them that path. But you have to encourage them to try out the more difficult content. And a lot of MMOs have that more difficult content, you know, the dungeons that uh, require more team play. And so what you do in the design is you try to encourage players to group up, to start doing some group content that's a little more difficult and requires some organization. And then, you know, by the time they reach the end game and you have some of your most difficult content, your raids, those are the things that uh, kind of challenge them the most. 
Um, though it would be cool if someone, you know, maybe developed a Demon Souls MMO. That would be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd be able to play that, though. I'm not hardcore enough. Yeah, yeah, me either. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sort of, our game's very similar to Matt's, uh, where is the challenge really comes into the muscle memory, but we also have the, the AI. And the challenge is certainly there on, on both sides. But um, our goal is, like you said, encourage grouping, but not force grouping. Um, you know, we're, we're going for that shooter market, and we want them to play together, and we want them to want to play together, but we really don't want them to force, to force them to play together. Um, and, yeah, I, I think, you know, difficulties dependent on the, on the market you're going for, and we're going for much more accessible. Um. I, I, I think it's, uh, it can get to be a dangerous conversation sometimes when you talk about difficulty or complexity equaling fun. Um, it, it's a conversation. So, you know, I heard the, the thinly veiled undertone to your question was, you know, I played EverQuest and I was really a tough guy and you played WoW and you were a sissy. Um, which is, the, that was where I was for, for that. I played, I, I put off playing Warcraft for years because it was, uh, it was Care Bear. It was way too easy. Uh, and then I played it and realized that I was an idiot. It was, uh, it was, uh, there was depth and there was complexity to it. It was very easy to get into very difficult to master. And um, that seems to me, uh, think about it, EVE Online. I mean, I, I, it, you have to have multiple degrees from MIT to log in. And, <laughs> and, and I, listen, they have as hardcore, as ardent, as passionate a fan base. I, we, you can only dream of having players that committed to your, to your IP, but it's a, it's a different game. And um, to, to get that into the mass market, that's just, and I think you're gonna see development times and budgets dictate complexity, because if you're gonna spend $120 million on a game, uh, you're not gonna do it to get 30,000 players. You're gonna be doing it to reach as large an audience as you can. And, you know, a lot of times, it, I heard this, uh, as a player, I heard it often, and, and now getting to be on the other side of the fence is, that a lot of times players don't actually want what they're asking for. Uh, you know, I, I, I participate in Fires of Heaven and, and post and talk to, to some of the, the most jaded human beings on the planet on that forum, and, and they're all crying for the, the, the permadeath days and the four-hour corpse runs, which were fun. Um, in, their, in the context, they were fun, uh, because you had nothing else to do. I, I did it. I, I can remember all of my memories of EQ or fond ones, but, but when I look at the, there was no competition. There was, no one else, there was nothing else to do, so it had to be fun, and it was. Nowadays, players won't do that anymore. I mean, not a large segment of players anyway, a meaningful Full group, and so you, you, you. I think at the end of the day, you have to tailor and cater to what you set out to build, and stay true to that. Because it, you know, the, you heard it a couple times from the panel. Uh, I think in the last four or five years, the market's become flooded with games that just could, didn't have an identity when they launched. They were trying to be everything to everyone, and ended up being nothing to anyone. So I think you know, the complexity thing is it's a, it's a. It, it gets back to what I said earlier. You guys are going to tell us. You guys are going to tell us, and, and you, you, you're going to vote with your time and your dollars, and, and they're almost, they're as equally valuable, I think, to us now as they've ever been. I mean, we're, we're, we're fighting each other for your time. There's only 24 hours in a day. You've proven you'll spend money on games you love to play, but you've only got 24 hours in a day, and you, that's, that's ultimately the biggest vote you can cast to, to, to the games that you play. All right, thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm sorry. I really hate to say this, but we're going to wrap up the question part. I'm really sorry, dude. You look like so eager. I, I know, but trust me, you guys stay. You want to stay. Go back to your seats. Just stay. I want to thank you all uh, on behalf of MMORPG.com for attending this panel. And now we have something very special from ArenaNet and NCSoft for you. So stay here, okay? Stay here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. How's it clipped on? Hi. Okay, so this is it. This is the game. Uh, we filmed this yesterday, actually, yeah, yesterday, and then I flew out here overnight. Um, I was going to play it live for you, but the computer broke on the airplane. So 
just kind of wanted to show you guys a little bit about the game and talk about things that are different about it and just kind of get to see a little bit what Guild Wars 2 is about. Um, kind of the basic things I want to talk about is how this game is a PvE and a PvP game. It's not just a PvP game. There are 25 giant maps. They take time, tons of time, 10, 15 minutes to run across. They're filled with content, thousands of dynamic events, and there's so much to do out there. I know we just had, are starting our beta weekends, and I recently played, uh, I think, six hours in one map without completing it. Uh, and, you know, never touched my personal story, never touched PvP, just because I got bogged down in this, you know, half of a map. Um, and so that's just kind of the, one of the basic things. And a lot of things we want to talk about are just what are the differences and what do you see? Because you look at the game, and this is one of the choices we made that, you know, you still are tabbing to targets, you're still pressing skills, but why is this combat different? What is different about this game? So you can watch me run for a little while now. Ah, <laughs> but. Uh, what we tried to do is create a very uh, action-oriented experience that still felt like it was about um, like an MMO. You're still controlling like an MMO, but you've got these things that are very different. Everything is very physics-based. When I shoot stuff, you know, anything that gets in the way gets blocked. People can dodge out of the way of stuff. They can move. They can use their skills. Their skills have very specific uses and uh, are very tactical. So, you know, you look at other game and you think. All right, here are my skills. Like, what is my skill rotation? How am I going to go through all this? What, am I, what buttons am I going to press? What order? Like, the game doesn't just work that way. You, know, you have to make decisions. All right, I saw, like, I'm attacking this devourer. He came at me. I make a different decision. I leap over him. I kind of go back. Right, my health is low, and I can decide what am I going to do. If I have him low, I can attack. I'm kind of always on the fly deciding what I want to do, and I'm kind of opening up different decisions as I play the game rather than just trying to go through a skill rotation. So just making everything really active. Every skill, pretty much, you can move while using it. Um, there's just a lot of uh, action, and uh, it's just very dynamic. And one of the things about this is just trying to create a combat where people can group together, but don't have to group together. Um, when they group together, they're actually playing together. There's actually teamwork. And you can see that uh, in a minute, well, I'm gonna, in this video, I'm going to join up with some other people, that we start organically working together, you know, regardless of whether or not we're grouped together. We, we have these cross-profession combos where players are creating things in the world that other players can interact with. But we also just have this natural, I can look at a guy, see he's low on health, I can, you know, ground target things to protect him. I can step back and see he's being shot at and get in the way and just block those attacks. So, um, just fighting this Minotaur. Uh, and basically, uh, that's one of the big things that we try to push is not forcing people to play together, but making them want to play together and want to see uh, what's happening. Oh, so uh, at this point, while we were playing, a dynamic event started up. So this is one of the other big changes. Uh, this big giant right here just smashed down this door, and he's breaking into this town. Um, you know, this stuff just happens organically, and players see it, and they just automatically have to work together, and they're not punished for working together. Everything they do is all about uh, how they can complete this together, and they share the rewards for it. So, <laughs> he can, uh, he's got uh, some pretty powerful big attacks. You can see him just kind of launching people around. So, this is one of our less static bosses, since I know people like to talk about how the big dragons are pretty static. Well, this guy's pretty big, and he moves around a lot. He actually smashed that door in before I got there. Um, all those NPCs in front are... Actually, there's a player down there. Oh, I just got, got knocked down. So this is our uh, down mode. You guys can see it a little bit. Basically, when you get to zero health, you have a chance to fight to come back. And uh, some of these guys are coming to try and help me. I don't think I'm actually going to make it back in this, if I remember correctly from yesterday. Uh, it's been a long day. So basically, we're gonna, I'm going to die right here. And then the nice thing is, you know, we can come back. The other guys that are in the group here are still fighting. <laughs> Uh, so, this is our map right here. You can see all the stuff, and there's a, a waypoint that you can travel to. So, I just travel there. Saw that really, really long load time that everyone's complaining about. Uh, and then you run across. Now, I'm going to just. I saw what this giant was doing. So, I went in, I switched my build, I brought uh, the Shadow Refuge, which is kind of a support thief skill to cloak guys and heal them. I brought a bow so I could uh, support my guys and teleport around, stay away from him. And now I'm kind of traveling back there to this event to take over. So one of the things about events is there's no start NPC, there's no end NPC, 
There's no competition about who's going to do it. There's no competition of who's going to get the best rewards for it. The important thing is that the whole game is built around this. Uh, we talked about this in the panel, just innovating. And someone said, you know, the reason why there's not this innovation is because the, you had this idea six years ago, and it takes six years to build this game, and now all of a sudden you're waiting, you wait around, and someone else has already done it. Well. That's why we went all in with our innovation. We didn't say, oh, well, we'll also have quests and we're also gonna have Trinity Combat. If you're going to do this, you have to do it wholly and completely. You can't just say, we're gonna do a things a little bit different and expect it to actually make a difference. So we had to go ahead and design the whole game around this. So here you go, I'm gonna drop this cloak on, on that ally. I'm gonna run in, run up and heal him. I use a, a skill that speeds me up. I got knocked down again. This giant's pretty tough, so. Took us a while to take them down. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that's just happening everywhere. Uh, there's an event right around this that I didn't get to in the video, but we played it again. You know, that's the thing is we played the game and then we stopped the video and then we just kept playing because it's just fun. And, uh, there's an event like right around the corner here where we go and there's uh, these cows and you put on a cow suit and you do all these tasks to teach them how to run in races. And then when you complete it, they, the, the char there start holding these cow races and you can go and like bed on the races and do all this stuff. It's just all about exploring the world. The world is very open and you can kind of just do whatever it is that you want to do. And, and you know, there's no forced path. It's not about, uh, you know, trying to follow a quest line, going to a quest hub. You see a little misconception about like the difference between these those hearts on the map and the events and uh those hearts are what we call renown and there's this stuff where you can kind of gate influence in an area to take it over we're about to take him down here he's a really awesome death animation so here you go yes so you can see we completed that event i just got some rewards for it and it that's it you know we all work together and everyone gets to play together they don't have to wait in line to kill a boss and you know, this is the stuff you guys are going to be able to see and then be able to play really soon. So we have uh, one other little special pr surprise for you guys. Um, on your way out, we got Enforcers, and we got Martin, and we got Regina, and they've got some beta keys. So there's plenty for everyone, I promise. Everyone on your way out, you can pick up one, one card, and it's got a key for you and a key for two more people to play in the next beta. And I promise we're getting close, you know. There's a lot of maps done, there's still work to be done, but the game is gonna come out, I promise. <laughs> so just hang in there and uh, you guys are gonna to see what it's like in just a few more weeks. All right. Yeah, we love you guys, too. You're welcome. If you want to sit and watch, you can just watch me. I'm going to die a few more times here, just so you know. We've, we made the game a little harder, too, so get ready. Um, it's not as easy as you think it is. Um, I know people have said it's a little easy, but just get, just get ready. You'll see soon enough. <laughs> 